church located at 1628th Street in Huntington. I'd love for you to come join us this morning for our morning worship service if you're able to get out. There's a few snowflakes out there, but it's not sticking to the road, so you should be safe. Just bundle up and come on out and join us at 11 o'clock for our morning worship service. If you don't want to brave the cold, then just join us on newbaptistchurch.com for our live stream. We have services on Wednesday evening also at 6 o'clock for Awana for the children and 6.30 for Bible studies uh, for the adults and also youth group meetings. Youth meets at 6. Youth meets at 6. Mm -hmm. um, I get here at 6, so uh, that's just the time for me. <laughs> I don't know when anybody else shows up. <laughs> well, we're going to let be, a, be led in prayer. Now I'm tongue-tied, Robin. <laughs> be led in prayer by Carl. Good morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give to us, Lord, that we can come to you in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the many answer prayers given to each one of us, Lord. We just thank you for that. Our Heavenly Father, just bless this country, Lord, and go through these trying times, Lord, that we know there was hands upon it, Lord, that it would, they would get their thoughts and minds to, towards you, Lord, and we thank you for that. Our Heavenly Father, just bless this Bless this time that we give them to us that we can broadcast across the air for those who can't come out and listen to you, Lord, that, that we can bring it to, to you. Our Heavenly Father, just bless each one that's here. Lord, lead and guide us. Watch over us. Jesus, let me pray. Amen. Our special music this morning is Carmen Bosa.
Well, good morning, and uh, good morning again, and welcome again to the radio broadcast here of New Baptist Church, our radio Bible class. We are so glad that you are here and with us today. It's always a joy to share this with you, and particularly today, uh, the uh, Sunday that we celebrate Veterans Day. Now, I know that that was on Friday, uh, and we are so appreciative of those who have served that we might be free, and that this radio broadcast might be on the air, and we can share and, and not be afraid, and how appreciative we are of our veterans. Today we'll be recognizing veterans in our worship service. So again, let me invite you, if you can, uh, as Sherry said, to come and join us uh, for our 11 o'clock worship uh, here at New Baptist at 610 28th Street. Uh, we'd love to have you. And again, if you can't join us in person, you can uh, join us uh, with our live broadcast of that. And there's a link uh, down on the left-hand side of our uh, church website, our, our web page. On the front page there down, there's a little uh, Facebook icon that'll take you right to our live stream. Well, this morning, we want I want us to continue in the text of uh, the church, uh, the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, or Philippi, as some of you say, but I lived in Philippi, West Virginia, and that's really the way you say it, and I, I'll, I'll say it that way uh, anyway. But uh, in the book of Philippians, uh, Paul writes about his own uh, kind of spiritual journey, uh, some of his spiritual struggles, but just how he got to that point of joy, and that's kind of the focus of, of Philippians. But today, uh, I've titled our message, uh, our class lesson today, When Being Good Isn't Good Enough. Uh, and that, that title can be taken many ways. Uh, so for some people, uh, they live their life thinking they're not good enough. Uh, that no matter what they do, it's just never, ever good enough. And so they work harder and harder and harder and harder. And they get more and more frustrated. And they feel like they're kind of on that, on that, uh, uh, like that hamster in the, in, the, in the wheel, just running in all kinds of effort but not getting anywhere, that nothing they do will be good enough. Uh, also, there are others for whom it doesn't matter how good you are or what you do, nothing is good enough. Uh, they always have a better way to do something. Uh, now, generally, that better way is in hindsight, but you know they can always tell you what's wrong and how you could do it better, and, and it doesn't matter uh, that they can do those things. Uh, you know, they're the kind of people that uh, you've heard uh, the saying that they would complain if you hung them with a new rope, uh, but that's not the focus of what we're doing here this morning. This morning, I want to attack a myth uh, that's believed by far too many, Christians particularly, but too many in our world, and that is that God judges us on the basis of our goodness. In chapter 2, uh, Paul gives us some instructions that I think have been misused by some to teach a salvation based on your works, on what you do. So if you have your copy of God's Word, you can turn to Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to start reading in verse 12 and down through the uh, through verse 17, and then he concludes the chapter with a couple of greetings and stuff, and then we're going to jump into chapter 3. Uh, but here we are, starting in verse 12, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. 
Well, as he starts, and, and there at the beginning of that where he says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Can you see how some would be misled? Uh, we face that same misunderstanding today. And that misunderstanding has led to some very popular but very bad theology. There are many who have been sucked into, into this kind of a, uh, of a theology, and it just does not take you where the Scriptures want you to go. It is a bad theology. There are those who teach, based on this and other Scripture, uh, that your uh, salvation is based on your works. It puts the emphasis on what you do rather than what God has done for you in Christ. If you do this, 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 and this, or if you work it out here, if you keep the Ten Commandments and all of those other kind of things, uh, if you, you know, do this, do this, do this, do this, and the emphasis is on what you do and not on what Christ has done, what God did through Christ for us, it's bad theology, and it leads you down a wrong path. There are others who take this and teach a kind of a health and wealth theology where if you do certain things, then you'll have health and wealth. Uh, you know, you won't, if you just have the faith, God, God will keep you and you won't get sick. Uh, you'll have money, you'll have wealth, you have all of that. And the sad thing is these teachers seem to miss or at least ignore Jesus' teachings about suffering and that if you're going to follow him, you're going to suffer. But they teach if you just, if you just do these things, you'll have health and wealth. You work out your own salvation. Others still teach a name it, claim it kind of a thing, and that, that kind of a theology simply makes God our spiritual bellhop or errand boy to give us whatever we ask. How sick are all of those theologies? And yet it comes, and as you can see, where Paul said, work out your theology, work out your salvation, people take that, and he goes on, though, if you remember what we read, he said that it's God who's at work in you. It's God's work. It's not ours. And yet we have twisted that so badly. For Paul, obedience is important. It really is. Obedience to God is important. But it comes as a result of faith and God's work in you not as a way to earn God's favor or to earn your salvation. It comes as a result of that. Is that I do these things because God has done a work in me, not because I'm trying to earn his favor. Do you see the difference? I certainly hope so. You see, Paul was a student of the Old Testament, and he understood exactly what Isaiah meant when, when Isaiah wrote these words in chapter 64 and verse 6. He says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are as filthy as a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Did you get that? Our righteousness is like a filthy rag. You see, being good does not merit God's favor. <laughs> I had a professor who used to say, the road to hell will be lined with good people with good intentions issue with God, the issue with God is not goodness, but rather it is forgiveness and faithfulness. And so let's look at what Paul goes on to write in chapter 3, where he begins to give his testimony and then some reasons and some issues involved with, being, with a being good based salvation. So look at this. Take your copy again and open it or or just uh, move on down to chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And Paul writes these words. He writes, Finally, brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me uh, and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a people of, uh, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, 
a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for your word. It is so powerful. And it speaks to us and to our lives today. I pray that you would take this word and use it in our lives today. Open our eyes and ears, our spiritual eyes and ears to see and to hear what you have for us. Open our hearts to understand it. And then, oh God, give us courage, strength in our wills to obey you and to live life as you intended it to be lived. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we look at what Paul wrote, look at his claim to goodness. He says he was circumcised on the eighth day in response to the law of Moses. He was keeping the law uh, of the people of Israel indicating a special relationship with God. The people of Israel called God's chosen people, and they were. God chose the Israelites and will, through them, bless the rest of the world, but that they were the chosen. He said, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, why is that important? <laughs> well, I don't know whether you knew this, but Benjamin was the only one of the 12 patriarchs born in Canaan, the promised land. They all of the others had been born, but not in, not in the promised land. They were the elite of Israel. A Hebrew of Hebrews, he says. One who still spoke Hebrew, in addition to the language of the people, too. But a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, he says, a Pharisee. Now, they were trained in the law. They studied the law. Their aim was to keep even the smallest detail of the law. Down to the littlest letter, they kept the law. Pharisees, well, we'd make them deacons in our church. <laughs> and that's a sad thing, isn't it? Because we look on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. But he says, as to the law, I kept it all. Good. He says, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Now, zeal was the greatest quality they were looking for uh, in religious life. They wanted people who were going after it. And Paul says, I was going after it, full tilt, to the point of persecuting the church. He says, and as for righteousness, which, uh, which the law could produce, I was blameless. I kept the law. There was no demand I did not fill. Did you catch that? Paul said, look, you want a pedigree, let me give you mine. All of this. You want a works-based salvation? I got it. I got it. Paul, though, understood he was good. <laughs> In fact, he was real good, but not good enough. Now, anybody out there want to challenge Paul's credentials? with your own? <laughs> uh, not me. Uh-uh. Now, Paul might go to God that way, but I, I'm, I, I'm not going that way. Not me. But look at what he says. He goes on. For Paul, the word righteousness meant a right relationship with God. Remember, it was on the Damascus Road. 
that Paul was literally exposed to the true righteousness and goodness of God. You remember that it was there that a bright light blinded Paul and the voice of God called out to him. And in the light of true goodness and righteousness, his own righteousness was exposed as worthless garbage. Rubbish, he uses here in Philippians. Do you remember the bleach commercials where they laid two white shirts shown together? Uh, one washed just regularly and one washed with bleach and how much brighter the bleached one was? <laughs> well, that's what Isaiah is saying. That's what Paul was saying here. You want to put your righteousness against God's? It doesn't measure up. We are, at best, dirty rags compared to God's righteousness. Paul goes on and he simply is saying that all my striving, everything I did, all my training, all of that never resolved the problem of my relationship with God. Now, I must tell you that as I read that, it caused me to ask, well, why? If Paul had done all of that, why was his relationship with God in jeopardy? Why was he not satisfied? And he goes on. Paul goes on to explain in this why. Why being good isn't good enough. This emphasizes being good, emphasizes the wrong things. Again, it puts the emphasis on us, on humans, rather than on God. Now, we have a philosophy out there that explains that. It's called humanism. It puts man's work at the center of salvation. It puts man as the standard by which, you know, my standard is good for me. It might not be yours, but it's good for me. And, and I, a man or a woman, you a person, are the measure of all things. And so you decide what's right and wrong. It puts us at the center of salvation rather than grace. Paul addresses them as those who would do that as Judaizers in his letter to the Galatian church. Salvation is no longer a gift of God, but a reward for good works, if you want to believe that. But it puts the emphasis on outward behavior rather than on the heart. And it allows different standards for different times. Now think about that. Different standards for different times. You know, there are behaviors that are accepted as normal today that were abhorrent just a generation ago. You can think of them. But there are behaviors today we accept as normal that would not have been accepted just a generation ago. So what's the standard? I remember seeing, a, uh, it may have been a post on Facebook, but it was showed a baseball, uh, the home plate, 17 inches wide. It's always been 17 inches wide. It doesn't matter whether you play in Pee Wee League or playing in the major leagues. Home plate is 17 inches wide. A standard. So what's the standard for today? What's the standard with God? Here's the truth. God doesn't grade on the curve. James said it this way. You break the law in one point, you're guilty of all of it. You ever told a white lie? You're guilty. You're guilty. Paul warns believers about those who would emphasize the wrong things, though. As we read through just a moment ago, look what he says. Those who would, uh, he says to watch out for those who would emphasize keeping the law as opposed to coming to God by faith, by grace through faith. He says of those who emphasize the law, he calls them dogs, evildoers, the party of humili uh, mutilation. And he says, you avoid these people like the plague. You run away from those folks. They have nothing good to offer you. They will make you feel good because of your own accomplishments. But he goes on to say, though, the sad thing is they nullify grace in your life. 
So you can work harder all you want, but understand you won't be experiencing the grace of God when you do so. Their righteousness does not fulfill your need. And your need of a relationship with God, it just won't get it done. So Paul says, avoid them. Avoid them like the plague. So what is good enough? Well, righteousness, whose source is God and whose basis is faith. Again, realize that at your best, righteousness is like a filthy rag. That's where we go back to what Isaiah said. All your work is garbage, rubbish, apart from Christ. Nothing you can do will meet God's standards. You cannot do it on your own. Salvation is a gift based on faith, not works. And it comes through Christ Jesus. It was Augustine, St. Augustine, who said, Our hearts are restless, O God, until they find their rest in thee. And it was Pascal, a great scientist, who said, There's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man that cannot be filled by any created thing but only by the Creator made known through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now there it is. Our hearts are restless. We want a relationship with God. We want that peace that comes. We want that forgiveness. There are those who would tell you, work it out yourself. And they are leading you away from the place where you can find what you need. By faith in Jesus Christ. In what God has done through Christ. The only way you can have a proper relationship with God, again, is by faith in Christ. There's no other way. No matter how hard you try, how sincere you are, how good you've been, Paul says, <laughs> it's all garbage compared to Christ. And Paul says that all his efforts at keeping the law in order to find a relationship with God, well, they were rubbish. King James calls it dung. We call it manure. Now the question is this. Do you want a relationship with God? Well, haven't you wallowed in your own works long enough? Isn't it time to trust Christ? To allow him to do his work in you? Being good is good, but it's not good enough. The simple act of faith that will bring you what you seek. Faith in Christ. A proper relationship with God. Will allow you to be the person God wants you to be. Let's pray together. Father, again, I give you thanks for the opportunity we have to share this time with you. To have your word instruct us. And oh God, I pray we would not be deceived by those who would have us look at ourselves and our own work and what we can do rather than trusting what you have done and in living our lives in response to your great work in us. Thank you for allowing us to be together today. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.